Okay. Good, good morning, every good morning, good afternoon, everybody. So glad for you that you came here and you're you're joining us for the What's Up with Us presentation. Got a fabulous special presentation today right. for our August presentation. Let me share my screen. Okay, David, JR, Ashley, do you see it? I do. It's up. We do. Oh, wow. Awesome. Awesome. Let's see if I can actually control it now. Perfect. So great. <laughs> We're all set. Um, we have myself, Neil Kalen, Ashley Peterson, and substituting in a nice wave, Ashley. Thank you. That's wonderful. And substituting in, coming back. We were just bum, talking bum, about bum. zombies coming back from the dead. <laughs> we have J.R. Richards, who's substituting in for Franz Faro today. So thanks, J.R. You're welcome. I'm not a zombie, but I am back. <laughs> it's the original dream team back together. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's like home. We are the original What's Up cast. And uh, joining us today for an interview. And of course, he's welcome to... A uh, comment on any of our discussion items is David Fu. So hi, David. Welcome. Hey, guys. Good to see you again. The yeah, good. David Fu. Let's see. <laughs> so what are we going to be talking about today? Well, if, if you happen to have seen the announcement that went out, one of the cases that was said in the announcement, it turns out, was an unpublished case. So we ditched that one, and now we're going to talk about some, something else, right? So we're going to go a little bit back in time today. Ashley's going to start off, start us off with the Fabian versus Renovate America case, and then we're going to talk about Bailey versus Citibank, an adverse possession case. Then we have our interview with David, which is, he's the most fascinating person of our panelists, how's that? I don't know about all of our. I don't know about everybody who's listening in, but David is really, really. Well, I think that's even a stretch, Neil. But uh, go ahead. I don't know. So we were talking great, great about interview. we were talking about Stephen McQueen earlier, so maybe you know you're our new candidate for that, David. Oh, uh, well, thank you, thank you. He's of course he's been <laughs> dead for twenty years, but <laughs> he's still cool. <laughs> he's got the That's cool true. factor no doubt about it <laughs> and then we're going to give an update on the cdc eviction moratorium it's like so fascinating with what's going on with that and we want to remind everybody of some upcoming mcle events um i mean i just signed up for one jr i think you're going to talk about uh, one that's coming up in september Cracker. and as as always if anybody has any suggestions we're open to your suggestions ideas and let's get right into it. Ashley, you want to talk a little bit about Fabian versus Renovate? Sure. All right. So this one is um, a 2019 case. So we're going back a little bit on this one, but we thought it was really important to discuss it. So that's why we're, we're highlighting it this month. Uh, Fabian, the facts of this case are that basically Fabian filed a complaint against Renovate America, Inc., uh, basically alleging that solar panels she purchased for her home were improperly installed. And Fabian alleged that in um, 2017, Renovate called her unsolicited to uh, ask her about financing the solar panels. And allegedly they signed her name on this financial agreement pursuant to a phone call with her. Um, everything was done telephonically and Fabian was never actually presented with any documents to sign. So uh, Renovate tried to compel arbitration pursuant to that contract that they alleged she signed. Um, and Fabian obviously claimed that she'd never signed it and that she, she was never presented with those documents. So um, she also claimed that Renovate was violating the Consumer Legal Remedies Act, the Unfair Competition Law, and the California Contract Translation Act. On the, on the document itself, there were words that said docu signed by with an electronic signature with her name and the date, um, and then the verification code that you typically see on, you know, DocuSign documents. Um, so uh, 
Fabian basically declared she didn't sign the contract. And so then the burden of proof was on renovate uh, to prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the electronic signature was actually authentic and that Fabian did, did sign. So uh, the trial court held that renovate did not meet its burden to establish the authenticity of Fabian's signature and the trial court denied their petition to compel arbitration. And so then renovate appealed and the appellate court affirmed the trial court's ruling and said that Renovate offered no evidence about the process used to verify Fabian's electronic signature via DocuSign, including who sent Fabian the contract, how the contract was sent to her, how her electronic signature was placed on the contract, who received the signed contract, how it was signed. So basically there was a whole lot of problems on Renovate then um, and they did not succeed in that situation. So any thoughts guys? I have some thoughts here. I thought this is one a great case because I love it. If you look at the appealing law firm, it was Reed Smith, who's like one of the biggest law firms on the planet. And the, the winning side was actually a much, much smaller uh, law firm. So it's almost like Citadel beating Alabama in a football game. It was an amazing feat. But really, if you look at it, uh, if it was Reed Smith or whoever the representing party in the lower court case just failed to lay a proper foundation for their signature. If she actually signed it, then it was kind of a failure on the attorney's part to lay a foundation as to whether it was actually signed electronically or not. Um, and it just goes to show just saying, hey, it was signed electronically is not enough. You got to lay a proper foundation. Yeah. I mean, and that comes up a lot now with like real estate documents too, especially with, you know, the car forms that Neil is so intricately involved with. Um, so yeah, I, I, there's, I have a lot of clients that are still very wary of using DocuSign because they don't, they don't like it. They don't trust it. And, you know, I can't blame them. Yeah, it's a good point. So before we go, before I talk about the car forms, for example, and the use of either um, DocuSign, and, and there, there's another one, which is for the life of me, I can't think of the name right now, uh, but they both work the same way. I'm just curious for anyone who has been around, you know, before everybody signed real estate contracts electronically, couldn't there have been a problem where somebody said, hey, I never signed that form, right? Wasn't, isn't that a possibility? Mm -hmm. And yeah. what, what would happen to, do either of our litigators, you know, anybody remember way back when? What, what would you do then if somebody said, I never signed that agreement. What would you do? Well, there, well, go ahead, David, you do it. You know, I, I was going to say that uh, this is really a lesson in hubris because if they contended, it, I mean, that wouldn't just come up out of the blue, would it? That the, that the, uh, the defendant is saying like, hey, that's not my signature. You'd think they would have engaged in a little bit of work to establish, especially Reed Smith, to, to establish uh, you know, what the foundation was for that signature. And that would have been true if you had had a fax signature or an emailed signature or, or even a wet ink original that somebody claims isn't theirs. You know, you're going to have to go get the writing samples, ask for samples of their signature, look at other uh, deeds and recorded instruments that they'd signed in the past or things of that nature. So, I mean, I, I, you know, Bad facts make bad law, <laughs> but um, in this situation, it's not that they're bad facts. I think it's that, uh, quite frankly, I think that um, surprisingly, this large firm sort of under litigated this case without, you know, John Wooden style going back to the basics. Yeah. Well, I mean, and like DocuSign has so many positives, you know, especially now with COVID, no one's meeting in person. So you can sign things electronically, virtually, whatever on your phone. But it also has a bunch of negatives too, because I mean, people are one, not reading the documents that they're electronically signing. And, you know, I mean, especially with the car forms, when you think about it, it's a packet of maybe 30 pages or more, you know. Oh, you mean people <laughs> used to read the documents. That's what you're saying, <laughs> Ashley? <laughs> right, Aaron, I'm sorry. I'm implying too much here. <laughs> Assumes facts, not in evidence. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. Nobody ever reads the documents. That's the point. <laughs> okay. But if they can that's prove that you right? approve them anyway, it's not an offense. You know, that's yeah. uh, the old, uh, you know, legal maxim is that like, I didn't know what I was signing. Ain't no excuse. <laughs> so I mean, that hasn't that's changed. True. 
that is very true. And so if they're using, you know, one of our purchase contracts, right, a, a car form, um, or it doesn't matter, one, one of the other companies forms too, it really, really doesn't matter for that matter. There's so many easy ways to set up that the person signed it. So you get a declaration from the real estate agent. The client gave me this email address to send to them, right? And then here is the way the system works. And then through the car zip form, whether you're signing in digital link or whether you're using DocuSign, there is an entire history that can be obtained. So like you say, the attorney needs to do a job, you know, subpoena that information, get the history, find out when a document was, was received, when it was sent back. And a purchase contract, unlike what you had here in the Fabian case, where maybe there was one signature and that was it, in a purchase agreement, you're going back and forth, you're signing multiple documents, right? So even if somebody says, oh, I didn't sign the contract, well, what about the various addendum? What about the various disclosures? What about the counter offers? There's so many parts to the transaction that's really a difficult claim to make, or it's incredibly easy to disprove, right? Yeah. If somebody puts five minutes you know, worth, worth of effort into it, um, like I say, it may be a little bit different for the Fabian case because I don't know, you, 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 sign, uh, you sign that one agreement that, that sets out the financing and, and maybe there's nothing else after that. I'm, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I, I, did know, have a, I, I did have a case recently uh, where uh, it was a real estate case. We were trying to uh, force specific performance and it ends up that the agent's agreement, the selling agent's agreement with the owner was signed by her niece. And, the, and even though it was the owner's email address, it was the niece who processed, she was going on to her, her, her aunt's email. And so the lady who was the actual seller, and so, and then the real estate agent had never met in person with the seller. So it was actually a big scheme by the niece to sell property owned by her aunt. And it was, it was a mess, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think in fairness also to Reed Smith on this thing is that that motion to compel arbitration is like the first thing you file uh, in the case. And so I don't think there was any discovery really at this point. And they probably just assumed that uh, that this was going to be granted because so many trial courts are at least apparently willing to move you know trash off of their dockets. So they probably assumed that it would be granted. But then taking it up on appeal, I think that's where the hubris comes in is that if you don't have good facts at that point, you probably shouldn't be taking it to the folks on Spring Street or in this case to the fourth district, so. Yes. You know, I like, I like what you raised a little bit earlier, which is, I know I've heard this issue uh, many times in the real estate situation, whereas you have um, multiple parties on one side, I hear this a lot, where you have a married couple and I know escrow companies want each signer to have a different email address, but many times there's just one. And this is particularly true if you might have an elderly couple. Maybe they have one email address. The two of them share it. They use it all the time. So you don't really know when they're sending something out for a signature or it's being sent out uh, through the electronic platform, who's the one who's answering that email? You know, um, is it signer number one, or is it signer number two? And is signer number one signing for signer number two? So that's why I say, I know escrow companies that say they won't do that. They affirmatively want a separate email address for each signer, but that may not always be possible. I say, especially, you know, I'm saying elderly, you know, here, here I am, I'm, I'm getting ready, you know, for, for my senior discounts on things. Um, <laughs> but, but, but at least me and my spouse, at least we each have our own email address. But it's it's an issue that comes up, you know, and, and that's something that may be relevant in future cases as well. Sure. Yep. Uh, all right. Are we through? Through with uh, Fabian? Yep. Okay. Yep. Great. And uh, Ashley, are you going to be with us for a few more minutes? I know you had to leave for another appointment. Yeah, do you want me to introduce uh, the Citibank one or do you yeah. want to take it? No, no, please, please. Yeah, so uh, Bailey versus Citibank, that's a fifth uh, district court of appeal case. Uh, and this is a property in Fraser Park, California. I don't actually know where that is. Does anybody know where that is? Fraser Park, no. Anyway, it sounds so, like LA, but I don't know yet. It's up off the five, up near uh, Gorman there. Oh, okay. <laughs> 
Okay. Anyway, so that property went into default by the original owners um, through the original mortgage lender that was from like 2004 or 2005. And then in 2013, the plaintiffs in this case actually took possession of this unoccupied property that was in default. So in 2017, Citibank took over the mortgage from the original primary lender that I don't know why it never actually went through with foreclosure before that time. Um, but Citibank took over and then the foreclosure took place in 2018 and then Citibank took possession of the property at that time. And so uh, at, during that foreclosure process, the plaintiffs filed quiet title action uh, naming Citibank as the primary defendant. And I guess there was some confusion with Citibank because they didn't answer the complaint and default was entered. And um, so then Citibank actually had to appeal the, or to move to set aside the default judgment that ended up getting granted. Um, and on appeal, basically the appellate court held that Citibank's interest in the property um, up until it obtained fee title interest in 2018, was not that of an owner with a right to possession. They were just a trustee beneficiary. So basically prior to Citibank gaining possessory rights um, at the time of foreclosure, the plaintiffs had no ability to, uh, their, their use and occupation of the property was not hostile to Citibank's rights as a secured lien holder. So that five-year adverse possession statute of limitations uh, didn't run against Citibank until they actually took possession of the property in 2018. So um, the plaintiffs lost in this case, um, and on appeal, the Citibank prevailed. So I, I think this is a really interesting case. One of the one of the facts here that's kind of important to realize is is this property or the estate of the original owners? Is it Lipson and Black? Were I think in, that's right. Yeah, they were in they were in bankruptcy during the entirety of this time. So basically, from 06 through eighteen, they were they had an open bankruptcy. Oh, that's right. Thank you for reminding me of that. Yeah. The property was actually subject to a bankruptcy estate. So I think it's more of a ruling that during a bankruptcy, you can't gain adverse possession over a property that's in the bankruptcy estate. I think that's kind of what this is saying. Otherwise, I was wondering, because David probably can expound upon this a little bit, is that when you have an adverse possession, right, you don't actually have ownership until the law, until you have a judgment. Otherwise, it's just a uh, a contingent ownership. So if I'm if I'm living on Ashley's property for five years, paying all the taxes, having a ball, I actually don't become I don't have anything until I sue and win the case against Ashley, right? Yeah, I think that's correct. You know, it, it rarely comes up. Everybody in the world thinks they have an adverse possession case, but they've <laughs> never paid the taxes. Right. <laughs> You're thinking like, excuse me. That's kind of a big deal, you know? Yeah. <laughs> or it's always over some little small portion of the land, you know, that right. it would be impossible to pay taxes on because it's such a small strip or whatever, you know? That seems to come up more frequently, I think. I don't think it's impossible, but nobody ever does. I mean, right. who goes to the assessor's office and says, I want to pay the taxes on this, you know, 320 square foot portion of this parcel. So right. it just doesn't work. <laughs> Well, so, my, yeah, I'll you. disagree with you a little bit on your assessment because the the adverse possessor here did claim title as against the original owner. So it right. didn't matter that the original owner was in bankruptcy, right? The right. issue was, did they claim title as against the lender? And uh, so, you know, the court mentioned something about you can't gain any greater rights than the person you're adversely possessing against, right? And so the owner, their rights in the property were subject to the lender's lien on the property. And so really, the adverse possessor really was just stepping into the shoes of the, of the owner who was, you know, in bankruptcy at the time. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you mentioned that there was other issues in this case. So if somebody wants to go to this case and says, you know, I'm interested in the, the real property issue that we're talking about today, you know, the adverse possession issue. And first of all, it's a great issue, right? Because if you look at what the facts say, it was such an obvious case of adverse possession. You know, David, you mentioned so few people actually pay the taxes. These people were paying the taxes, 
right? So yeah. they were meeting everything, right? Yeah, you know, you've got your chickens and goats and whatever, their pigs, you know, running around. Storage trailers and everything on the property, yeah. So it was definitely <laughs> so open and notorious. <laughs> open and notorious, yeah. Yeah, notorious, I think, is the right word for this particular case. <laughs> um, but it's but it's really just one aspect of this case. And so if you're looking for the real property part of this case, you're going to have to skip through about 20 pages of the opinion, right, yeah. about the issues that Ashley mentioned earlier, um, which is there was a default judgment and what happened with the default judgment. And, and for you litigators, that may be, you know, really good stuff, too. But <laughs> we were focusing on the on the real property aspects of the case. So. That's where that's where we that's where we land um, with Bailey versus Superbank. Yeah, it's kind of curious though because you think that probably if they just waited a few more years, Citibank would have still been asleep. They would have still been paying the property taxes, and then they could have perfected their claim. They just were too early, yeah. really. Yeah. Right. So. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it does evidence you know, the, the difficulty for a lender that size to be able to track, uh, you know, their REO portfolio and and really be able to defend against these things. If you've got a clever plaintiff who's actually going to follow the code and, and being able to take this property, um, you know, I think this is sort of a subset of other problems that we see everywhere. My nephew told me the other day, he walked up to a rental house that he owns and uh, opened the door and a guy was standing there. And the guy said, who are you? What do you want? And he said, I own the house. And the guy, the, the guy in the door said, no, I own the house. And had some like utility bills that he showed my nephew. And uh, it shows that the guy had been living there for months already, but it was really just a squatter. Wow. <laughs> and um, So he called the cops. And thankfully for him, he just happened to be going to like the assessor's office that, that day. So he happened to have like copies of all of his ownership documents, because otherwise the L.A., PD was going to tell them, well, I can't tell who owns this place. You're on your own. Uh, right. But as it is, they were uh, very uh, useful and they managed to eject that trespasser. Wow. Uh, yeah, that's that's an interesting issue on another level. <laughs> yeah, so just who, a lot of that's it? going on these days. Yeah. Wait, so how did they get... To who actually ejected the trespasser? Who, I'm sorry, I missed that part, David. Who was? Who oh, rid of the cop. My nephew called the cops, and they yeah. first they said, "Well, this is a civil matter. We don't know who owns what." But right, right. my guy, uh, my nephew, actually happened to have copies of his grant deed and his driver's license and things like that. And he could say, "No, I really own this house." And the other, the trespasser, of course, had nothing but utility bills showing his name and address on the utility bill, and that's not a badge of ownership. So they said, "Nope, you got to go." That's lucky because I feel like most people that now in this day and age are going to have to go through the whole eviction process, even with squatters. Uh, yeah, yeah, very challenging. I, yeah, I thought okay. the rule was is if they were in possession of the property, even as a squatter for more than two days, that you actually have to go through a proper eviction process. You got lucky with the cops is what happened there. Yeah, yeah. caught them on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you win the cases you should lose, and sometimes you lose the cases you should win. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it goes. So it goes. <laughs> so that, that, that's good stuff. Like I say, to me, that's really the exception to the rule because from what I hear out in the field, once the cop says that's a civil matter, it doesn't matter what you show them. They're through. That's like, that's great. Those are legal documents, but it's not our call mm -hmm. as a policing authority to make a legal judgment as to whether your papers are valid or not. So, yeah, good, good for your relative to, to, get, to <laughs> convince them. That, you know, that, that falls in the, uh, you know, never a cop around when you need one kind of uh, tangent. But a, a funny story is, you remember years and years ago, Zsa, Zsa Gabor was uh, arrested for slapping a, a Beverly Hills motorcycle officer. Oh yeah. Yeah. So my, my mom had an apartment building in Beverly Hills and I was going out to like take care of stuff there. And I go to the dumpster and it's filled with like lumber from the construction project next door. And there's this big burly like contractor there. And I said, excuse me, you can't put your stuff in my dumpster. And he kind of said, well, what are you gonna do about it? So I picked up my car phone. I called the Beverly Hills Police Department. The same cop came in on, you know, on his motorcycle 
and turned to the contractor and said, you need to unload this now. And we both sat and watched the guy unload my dumpster with all the lumber that he had put into it. Oh, nice. <laughs> and then I said, hey, you're the guy that Jaja slapped, right? Because that's me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> my brush with pop. fame. <laughs> That's cool. So, so the the David Fu influence in this last story is a perfect lead-in to our David Fu interview. So we're gonna shift gears. We're gonna go away from Bailey, and we're gonna go into David Fu. And here he is, handsome guy that he is. Well, he's and, like twenty-five uh, there. <laughs> I'm like 25 now, twice, or I've had some. <laughs> a little, little bit of touch-up work, no big deal. Um, no, David, you, you look good in the picture and you look good live, so it's great. We're so happy to have you here. And, you know, before we start discussing things, why don't you just tell us a little bit about you and your practice, and then we, then we, can, start at, we can start asking you questions. Well, um, I am a garden variety real estate lawyer. I practice in Arcadia, California. I have two associates in my firm right now. We just started to actually uh, virtually office. So I'm you know, coming to you live from my home office, which is now the nerve center of David Fu and Associates. Um, as you mentioned earlier, I was the chair of the section or co-chair with, along with Greg Marco in 2012 and 2013. After that, I uh, was appointed to the Commission on Judicial Nominees Evaluation or the Jenny Commission, which is the state bars organ that conducts confidential investigations of all judicial candidates uh, seeking appointment by the governor in the state of California from the Supreme Court down. I served on the commission for three years, uh, for, sorry, for four years and, and the fourth year as the chair of the commission. And as you mentioned in our lead in, I've been appointed now to serve on the Judicial Council, which is a policymaking body for our court system. It's chaired by the Chief Justice and mostly um, uh, comprised of other bench officers. There's at least one associate justice. There's several other justices from the District Courts of Appeal and uh, numerous other trial judges. There are only four attorney members, and then I think about four public members that are also appointed to the council. Uh, it meets six to eight times a year, and it sets the policy for the uh, court system. And the judicial council was, for instance, the body that uh, made the determination that evictions would be um, uh, stayed during the time of the initial COVID um, phenomenon. Um, and I'm um, not starting that service until September. So when I'm after September the 30th, I'll tell you more about it. But for now, I'm only speculating. So um, I don't know what more can we talk about, Neil? Are we going to so talk I about food a, now? <laughs> so but before you do, I want to ask you a question about your, your practice. You said garden variety real estate. So, you know, rough estimate, what percentage of your practice is litigation, what percent of it is transactional real estate? And what percentage would you say is residential versus commercial? Well, um, there's a little bit more background on me. I started my life uh, as a real estate broker and then also as a commercial investments broker. I sold shopping centers, apartment buildings, office buildings, development land and things like that uh, back in the 80s and then went to law school in the 90s. Um, so we are a very real estate centric firm, but quite candidly, when I quote designed my practice, I designed it for quote people who can pay lawyers. So that is mostly real estate investors uh, and business owners. Um, I would guess that about 80% of our work is real estate uh, related. Uh, and of that probably 75 to 80% of it is actually real estate litigation. Uh, and the rest being transactional work, but uh, you know, a law firm like mine uh, seeks to cater to the needs of our clients who don't want to call six different law firms. So we will handle many of their uh, legal needs uh, if it's not personal injury, divorce, or something like that. And we stick with all of our business fields. Um, so I also have a master of laws degree in taxation. So we do some estate planning and things of that nature um, and service to those clients. 
So, so one thing I want to point out about David is, is he was appointed the solo small firm attorney of the year in 2018, um, which is quite an honor. It's awesome that you were able to do that. So what happened in 19 and 20? You couldn't, couldn't three-peat it or just... Uh, well, you know, only three of us voted that time and I got one other guy to vote for me. You know? <laughs> so one more question. I got a couple like burning questions, Neil, forgive me. But first off, you went to high school in Beverly Hills? Uh, first of all, yes, I did go to high school. A lot of people have questions about that. <laughs> <laughs> Secondly, I'm actually out of high school. People also have questions about that. <laughs> and thirdly, yes, I went to Beverly Hills High School, the uh, home of the rich and famous or rich and fatuous, as the case may be. <laughs> um, one of the things I say to people is that um, Ali Mayorkas, who is now the director of Homeland Security, I think, um, was uh, you know sort of one of the nation's top cops, was in the class before me. And in the same class was Jack Abramoff, who was sought after by the top cops in the country. <laughs> so, um, you know, we had both ends of the spectrum. Jack Abramoff, by the way, is a remarkably nice guy, very hardworking. I'm sure he just fell off the straight and narrow. For those of you who remember who Jack Abramoff was, uh, he was called Casino Jack because he ran afoul of the law and some influence peddling allegations regarding Indian casinos. But um, super nice guy. He was the president of the varsity club. I was after him. We played football together and really a, a decent guy. I'm not sure what happened there, but and Ali Mayorkas is the nicest guy in the world too. Very bright killer tennis player <laughs> um, wow. and just a just a really super guy um, in the class before him was Jamie Lee Curtis Sean Cassidy um, <laughs> you know Sean Clark Brandon, Cass other teen heartthrobs yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, you know folks of that nature um, all right all right so that's awesome Sean Cassidy I haven't even heard that name and like <laughs> Neil but anyway the um, the Hardy uh, Boys. <laughs> tell me, tell me about Foo's Garden Restaurant and what was going on with that. I want just want to Foo's Garden Restaurant didn't really have a garden, but it did have a foo. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it was uh, one of our restaurants uh, that we owned. Uh, it was in Culver City, and I ran it uh, when I worked my way through law school. Um, it's funny because I kind of you know I'd come from my real estate career. Uh, the market had crashed in the 90s. Um, I had left Kennedy Wilson, which was on its way to becoming the world's largest real estate auctioneer. Um, and I just thought, you know, it was time for me to think about doing something different. So I ran uh, this neighborhood Chinese restaurant and, uh, you know, did deliveries for the restaurant in my Mercedes Benz. And um, it was bad for tips is what I found out. <laughs> But, Nobody uh, wants to tip a rich delivery guy. Uh, what's the deal with that? <laughs> what is the deal with that? So, uh, hey, how do they know it? You know whether or not it was leased? Come on. You know, I'm, uh, I'm gonna. I'll bug you more cheap. about that later. I'll bug you more about Foods Garden Restaurant another time. Okay. Okay. Fair so, enough. so David, I'm I'm gonna bring us back a little bit to business here, um, and and then we'll we'll let we'll let Jr. You know bring up all the fun stuff. Um, so, so I'm, I'm curious about this, you know, pretty impressive resume with what you've accomplished, you know, <laughs> Jenny commission, soon to be the judicial council. You know, so are you like some big political donor or something? How, how does one, you know, manage to, to, to snag these, you know, rare and illustrious appointments? Um, you know, the answer is no. <laughs> um, okay. but you know, I think that if it's, it's about service and, um, getting involved in your bar organization, wherever it is, you know, I started, uh, in my third year in practice, uh, serving on the board for the Culver Marina Bar Association. Uh, and I was the president of that bar association, small bar association in the West side of Los Angeles. Um, I was then appointed to the executive committee for the LA County Bars Real Property Law Section uh, and the chair of uh, what was then um, sales and brokerage 
for the state bars real property law section. I uh, did some, uh, you know, really great program for the sales and brokerage subsection and was invited to apply for the XCOM for real property. Served there and we did a lot of great stuff during those years on XCOM. Uh, we created some awards that we don't do anymore, the Morning Star and the Real Property Person of the Year. Um, and uh, really had a lot of fun and, and did great programming there. Uh, and after that, having nothing to do. <laughs> I started to look for other places to volunteer within the bar and applied for Jenny, which actually is very competitive, um, very hard to get into. Um, and for whatever reason was selected for that. I think in part because I had served as the chair of property and um, the then chair of the Jenny commission was curious about that because that was Jason Lee. And uh, he later was appointed to the State Bar Board of Trustees and was the president of the bar, the first Chinese American president of the bar um, about four years ago, I believe. Uh, so I think one thing leads to another and like, like your law career and many other um, aspects, uh, serving the bar and doing what's good for your community and, and good for the community of lawyers leads to other opportunities to serve. Um, as long as you demonstrate integrity, um, do the job that you're asked to do and, uh, and, and serve and have a good time. And so I think those things have led so far to uh, the appointments. I actually didn't apply for judicial counsel. Uh, I was invited to, um, to serve. And so, um, you know, I was very lucky in that respect. Uh, and I've, I've enjoyed all of it. You know, I've, I've met tremendous people in every different aspect of service I've had for the bar. You know, I, I told Neil the story earlier that, um, you know, most people don't know what the XCOM is for real property. And they would ask me, you know, well, XCOM, what's that? And I would answer, you know, the XCOM is about 25 of the best and the brightest real estate lawyers in the state of California, plus me. <laughs> and, you know, and, and you, so you get a chance to serve there and do different things. And people don't know what Jenny Commission is either. But the Jenny Commission, um, you know, stands at the crossroads of politics and law, really, because uh, the governor may not appoint anyone uh, to the bench without putting that name through the Jenny Commission. There's an exception in the last 90 days of the governor's term. Uh, he may appoint anybody he, he or she would like. Um, and the Jenny Commission itself was created as a creature of controversy way, way back when, when Jerry Brown was a young and handsome fellow and first served um, in the governor's mansion, he left the state temporarily on some international trip. And Mike Kerb was the Lieutenant Governor and Mike Kerb was um, from the other party and, and they were not close. And while Jerry was out, Mike appointed certain uh, members to the, to the bench and when Jerry returned, <laughs> you rescinded those appointments. <laughs> so um, that led to kind of a brouhaha. And uh, out of that controversy was born the Jenny Commission in order to create um, a substantive process for the vetting of judicial candidates. Um, and quite frankly, to kind of slow down the process so that uh, it takes longer, it's more thoughtful, and um, someone can't appoint somebody to the bench on a whim. Um, and the exception being because the governor's term in the last 90 days would not allow time for a candidate to go through Jenny, the governor gets a free pass and is allowed to appoint anybody he or she would like. So it, it's a fascinating work. Um, you know, in terms of the, the work on the commission, I tell people, that, imagine that you're playing a parlor game. It involves real life people with rules that are created under the government code. It serves in secrecy and is uh, confidential. It's punishable by law if you violate confidentiality and you make real life, real life decisions that are going to affect tens of thousands of people over the course of the career of these bench officers. I can't begin to tell you just how fascinating it is and how much, how challenging it is to think about what it means to you that you wanna see in a bench officer. What kinds of qualities about diversity, about lack of bias, about um, their backgrounds and their understanding of the law and, and, and the nuances of, uh, of what goes into a really reasoned judgment that affects people 
you know, at the very core of their lives. It, it's something, to be honest, I hadn't really given it that much thought when I applied. And obviously, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid while I was there and, and really fell in love with it. Well, so one thing that you're making me think of is I recently had to read the but B-U-T-T decision. It had to do with the uh, city, uh, Richmond School District and whether they were obligated to, even though they ran out of money, were they obligated to teach all the kids till the end of the year? So we had a local superior court judge make that decision that they that Richmond was obligated to do that, went up up the all the way to the California Supreme Court. Like what a responsibility they had. Like we're talking about 3,000, 4,000 kids and whether they get to finish the school year. Like what a tremendous responsibility those judges had. Yeah, people ask me if the reason why I did is because I want I aspire to the bench and I tell them no, because number one, I played my cards wrong. I can't really afford to go to the bench. But <laughs> but number two, <laughs> um, it's really hard work. It's tremendously hard work, especially under current court conditions, the, you know, the constant perennial budget challenges that our court system faces uh, and everything about it really makes that, jo that job hard. So, you know, give bench officers a break. You know, they, they work really hard for the most part. And, um, but, you know, you should hold them to that standard as well that, uh, that they should do their jobs. So David, before we move on and get to the rest of our agenda, you know, first of all, that was a fabulous testimonial. I think anybody who's listening today, you know, think, hey, maybe I should get involved, you know, with the real property section. You could start with something small. We have what are called practice area committees. You can write an article for the journal. You could write, you know, a smaller article for our uh, monthly e-news. And just getting involved. You make contacts. You open up your mind. Uh, you start experiencing new things that did. A fabulous testimonial. If somebody has a real estate case that fits within you know, the description you gave us and they want to reach out to you, uh, do you want to you know, give you know, some kind of an address so they can reach out to you for it? Of course. So obviously, you can hunt me down on the state bar, but my email address is david at davidfuesq.com. But I think more importantly, if you're interested in service with the, with the section or if you're interested in applying to Jenny, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to entertain your question and tell you a little bit more about it. Um, uh, you know, one day when I learn more about the Judicial Council, I'll be happy to tell you about that as well. <laughs> but uh, if you ever have a question out there and you like, uh, you know, a little bit of uh, inside baseball, just let me know. I'd be happy to share that with you. Yeah, very generous. Thank you, David. Okay. So let's, let's kind of move on. We'll just kind of briefly go through you know, our update to the CDC eviction moratorium, right? We have this moratorium was originally supposed to expire um, at the end of July of this year um, when, <laughs> when the extension was made through the end of July, the CDC said, I've kind of highlighted in sort of that um, orangish box, this is intended to be the final extension of the moratorium, right? And then a, a few days, after they did that, what happened? A case that was going up that was challenging the CDC eviction moratorium, uh, uh, Alabama Association versus, versus Health and Human Services. That case, the trial court judge found the CDC had exceeded their jurisdiction, um, had initially issued a stay of the CDC order case went up on appeal to the D.C. Circuit Court. D.C. Circuit Court vacated the stay and then ultimately it eventually went up to the California Supreme Court just a few days after the CDC made their announcement that we're not extending this um, past, past July 31st. And what happened, the U.S. Supreme Court said, well, we're not going to hear the case, right? Um, but there were four justices that said we would have granted the application to hear the case and presumably um, allow the stay to go into effect, overturn the vacating of the stay, right? And then one justice, Justice Kavanaugh said, well, I actually think that the CDC did exceed their authority, but you know, it's scheduled to expire and uh, at the end of July. So, you know, there's no sense in hearing the case. 
it's going to go away. The whole issue is basically going to be moved. And by allowing this one month period of time, some of this money that was allocated from the federal government will have a chance to reach, you know, the landlords and tenants that have been experiencing difficulties during this entire period. Okay, great. So that's where we are. We think it's all said and done. And then what happens on August 3rd, right? Three days after the expiration, uh, what happened then? The CDC issues a quote, new moratorium. Um, the CDC, you know, apparently was, you know, reading the briefs and reading the orders and said, oh no, no, this is a brand new moratorium. It's not an extension of the one that expired, you know, at the end of July. And we're narrowly targeting it to areas that are experiencing substantial or high levels of community COVID transmission. Great. And so you see in their own document, they're narrowly targeting covered 80% of US counties. Okay. And then they also go on to say, and by the way, we might want to extend this, you know, in the future, as you see right there on page seven, right? So kind of almost snubbing their nose, right, at the US Supreme Court, but presumably following the instruction of uh, the existing administration. So what happens after that? Well, the Alabama Association, they bring back a case, okay? They bring a motion to enforce the, well, they're saying to enforce the Supreme Court's ruling. It's not really the Supreme Court's ruling. They're really bringing a motion to, um, to, to vacate the stay and allow the lower court's original stay to come into effect for the new moratorium that runs, um, what, August, September, and October. The court looked at this, the same court that you know, granted the stay originally, and they said, well, first of all, we think this violates everything too, but really what you want us to do is go back and rehear our order. And I think probably true to what judges, you're talking about judges, what judges are supposed to do, they said, you know what, but our hands are tied. There is an appellate court authority that vacated our stay. If this is really just an extension, first of all, the court said, Alabama, you're saying to treat this as an extension of the prior rule rather than something brand new. If this is an extension, the appellate court has already ruled on that. And the appellate court says, no, we're not going to allow the state to come into effect. So if you have a problem, take it up with the appellate court. There's nothing that we as a trial court could do. By the way, JR, I'll let you go through this. On Monday of this week, they did just that. They filed an emergency petition with the appellate court. The appellate court did expedited um, briefing on the case. The briefing ended yesterday. Whether they're gonna do an expedited ruling or not, we don't know. Okay, go ahead, JR, sorry. I was just trying to figure out, so um, we all know that the Association of Realtors in every state is very powerful. And I'm trying to figure out what is the motivation of the Alabama Association of Realtors do? Is there basically a feeling that the moratoriums are holding up real estate sales? Um, because I am getting a lot of calls for people like, hey, listen, I'm not getting paid. I want to just sell this place. Um, and so is that is that the feeling or why would Alabama Association of Realtors be really fighting this moratorium? Yeah, it's interesting that they were the lead plaintiff. And, and I don't have a good answer for that. But I suspect that a lot of their members are property owners or represent property owners. Mm -hmm. And so they're saying this is adversely affecting our membership right. because as property owners ourselves, we're not collecting rent or as property managers, mm -hmm. we are finding that our livelihood is at risk because rent is unable to be collected. And therefore, how do we collect, you know, the, um, uh, how do we collect our income based upon our property management agreement if no rent is coming in? So I suspect that was probably part of the thought process that went into filing the action in the first place. Interesting. Yeah. 
So we'll have to see what's happening. Like I say, the the, uh, the appellate court briefing at the D.C. Circuit Court uh, was supposed to be completed yesterday. And, you know, we'll find out whether they, you know, stay with their ruling that says, no, um, we are not going to vacate the stay and we're going to say it still applies. And whether the so in quote unquote new order, you know, expires at the end of October or whether it's extended, it's all up in the air at this point, right? Um, for those of us in California, I think an important point to know is that California has a statute dealing with an eviction moratorium. And so arguably the CDC order is not really applicable because action was taken by a government body, right? The California legislature, as opposed to an administrative agency, the CDC on the national level. Hey, JR, we'll, we'll want, could you talk about what's up coming up at, um, you know, at the real property law section? Absolutely. We've got some great events coming up. I don't know if anybody's paying attention, but basically since May of this year, we've had amazing online events, plenty of them. Like June was like chock full of different things. If you ever want to go see a replay of any webinar, CLE or anything like that, you just go back onto our website and check it out. But we still have a couple classes left in the uh, Cannabis Symposium, which uh, obviously it's a big, a big uh, uh, issue these days. And from what I've understand, stand, what I understand is, is we've had a whole series of experts really kind of walk people through the legalities of cannabis, everything from leasing to licensing and everything like that. Um, Neil, were you you were uh, part of one of those uh, seminars? Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, I was I was part of a panel of three that just <clears throat> excuse me that discussed cannabis impacts on real estate leasing and sales, as well as both commercial and residential. Yeah. Uh, from what I've seen along those trends is there's a lot of rundown properties that have been reinvigorated and, and because of cannabis uh, grow, grows or distribution places or anything like that, because, you know, mm -hmm farther away from school districts, things like that, where they could be actually used, for example, cannabis growing. So is that part in part what you were talking about? Now, I personally was focusing most on the residential, residential real estate and what brokers can and cannot do, as well as buyers and sellers in the residential side. The two other speakers, one was speaking exclusively on commercial sales, and one was speaking exclusively on commercial leases. And there was just a lot of really good information, like all of the other CLA um, seminars, you know, th these are gonna be available at some point in time in the, in the library, in the, in the CLA, MCLE library, I guess. Right. But I mean, there was a couple of things that I wasn't aware of that were, that were very interesting to me that my co-panelists were talking about. One was, kind of the difference in personality of what you see in the cannabis space these days. You have the old timers that are very, I don't know, like hippie-like and think they can kind of do whatever they want and how dare the government tell me what to do with my property and my growing. And you have the newcomers who are very business-like, yeah. right? And, you know, mostly want to comply with the law and know the regulations and are dealing with attorneys and so there's a real culture clash going on currently in the in the space. I imagine as time goes on, the old timers are going to disappear and you're going to see, you know, the big money, you know, corporate entities, you know, take over that that space. But kind of interesting now about how, how the two of them deal with each other. And, you know, something I, I was not really aware of, which was those who are in who are landlords who want nothing to do with this business except maybe take the money in from a tenant, they've got to be very careful because if they wind up having an ownership interest in the tenant, there's certain disclosure requirements that they have to make. If they take percentage rent from a cannabis tenant, now they're going to have certain disclosure interest that the landlord has to make. If they wind up financing the tenant, guess what? Certain disclosure interest that they're going to have to make. So if you really just wanted the money, 
but did not want to have all of these other obligations. You got to be very careful in that space. And that was, you know, new information to me as well. I, would, I always think it's so fascinating how many landlords, the commercial landlords are like, no, I don't want to rent to cannabis. Oh, for that price, all cash. Oh uh, yeah, I think we can do that. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> anyway, so uh, the other event, and I'm just going to tell you the Crocker commercial symposium is amazing. Um, so I, I'm not a commercial uh, real estate attorney and I am a broker. I'm not a commercial broker either. And I'm never, I never cease to be completely impressed with the Crocker uh, commercial symposium, whether it's just to get a gauge on where commercial properties are going these days. I actually think it's the biggest question facing us. Like in my hometown, there's so many commercial spaces that are practically empty or empty for various reasons. How are these properties going to survive? And then if you listen to what these panelists are going to talk about, how come they're building so much new commercial properties right now? C companies like Google or whatever these other kind of what I would consider kind of more um, internet based uh, companies are not building so much, but commercial real estate is still thriving. So I want to get, that's why I'm going to uh, the Crocker. I've already signed up for it. I'd encourage everybody to go to that. Any comments from either you or David on the Crocker? I know both of you have attended it in the, in the past. Uh, you first, David, if you have anything to say. Well, I was just going to say that I, I, I just echo what JR has to say. It, it, you know, for me, um, a lot of the time, the stuff going on at Crocker is, is the big leagues of real estate law, you know, the very large transactional areas. But and so that's, uh, you know, probably above my pay grade a lot of the time. But sometimes what's being talked about are that kind of uh, 30,000 feet uh, overview of trends in the industry. And that's really interesting. I, I remember we had, uh, we did that meeting where we had WeWork come and talk to us. Remember that about six or seven years ago? <laughs> and um, well, I mean, that was one trend we thought was coming and, and maybe still is, but WeWork itself fell on some very hard times. So you see some really interesting programming and some very interesting discussion about uh, about the future of real estate. And it's really a, a good meeting and stuff that I use a lot when I go out and talk to uh, other industry groups and real estate brokerage groups. Well, thank you, David. Yeah, I remember that one as well. That that was a great session. I, I've been to, I think I missed one, one, uh, one of the Crocker symposiums. First of all, now it's a, it's a joint effort with the real property section and the Los Angeles County Bar. Want to make people aware of that. Two, look at your screen. It is so unbelievably cheap to attend. And if you sign up by tomorrow for the early bird special, you're listening to this, you're probably a member of the real property law section, $35 for three fabulous panels to give you a great overview. I'm primarily a residential attorney. I go because I wanna know what's going on in the industry at large. If you attend one of the panels, you know, you've, you've more than made up for the cost if you do this in the early bird special. It is just such an unbelievable deal this year. Um, again, you know, you, JR, you say you're going, it's, it's a virtual event this year. So you don't have to leave, you know, your house or your pajamas, right? You know, you could, you could listen at home. Um, we're, we're running right up on our deadline. I want to let everybody know. You could see, you can, you could take some, you know, webinar replays. If you like uh, the what's up with us, they're not in the MCLE library, but you can see past presentations of what's up with us on the CLA YouTube page. So, um, you know, or go into YouTube's type what's up with us, real property section or something like that. And you can find some of our, some of our back uh, events. Wow, I see we're coming right up at 1.30. So how about closing remarks? First of all, I'll, on behalf of Ashley, she had another appointment today, but I'm so glad you know she was able to join us for, for the first part of our presentation. Uh, she's been a regular with us, outstanding. So I'm so glad she's here. I'm just saying bye on her behalf. Uh, David and JR, any last comments? David, I'll go first here, but thank you both for just hitting it out of the park. You know, it was just awesome to be back in the what's up with us. And as always, Ashley is a superstar. So uh, thank you for making it such a great hour. 
And same here, uh, Neil and Ashley and JR. It's really great to see you all again. And thanks for including me. It was a lot of fun. And, oh, perfect. So I saw there was a question about how to sign up for Crocker. I was just looking it up. But uh, Micah, our CLA staff, just posted it into the chat. So great, great, great stuff. Thanks for joining us, David. You're, you're a great guest, great interviewee. Um, and we, we learned a lot from you today. And we've gotten some good comments in the chat. So we can attribute that to you because JR and Ashley and I, we've been around for a while, but we don't always get such nice comments. So thanks a lot, everybody. Hope you can join us next month. Bye.